entonces con este seminario internacional eh, de formación inicial en docente. Espero hayan tenido un excelente receso y continuamos entonces con más expositores. Eh, antes quisiera comentarles que también tendremos un espacio eh, de preguntas para que ustedes ya las puedan escribir eh, cuando empiece la conferencia, por, por supuesto, en el chat de, eh, de este seminario. Bueno, a continuación viene la siguiente conferencia, asumiendo riesgos para mejorar el aprendizaje desde la experiencia para los futuros profesores, vinculando la universidad y la escuela a cargo de Tom, Tom Russell. Eh, bueno, contarles que Tom es eh, doctor en filosofía por la Universidad de Toronto y es académico en la Universidad de Queens, Estados eh, en Canadá. Sus áreas de interés se centran en la enseñanza de las ciencias y la formación de profesores. Entonces, dejo con ustedes a Tom Russell. Adelante, entonces, profesor. Tom Russell, entonces, eh, viene a continuación eh, con su... No, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Can you see me? Es importante, importante mencionarles a todos que pueden ir a este seminario. Considera traducción simultánea. Abajo Sorry. pueden encontrar entonces esta español inglés. Adelante, eh, doctor. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, muy buenos días. Agradezco mucho la oportunidad de participar en este seminario. Uh, I want to begin by thanking the university for the opportunity to contribute. I also want to thank the translators who make it possible for me to speak with you. And I also want to thank the technology people for the good work that they are doing. I want to begin by thanking Sharon Feynman Nemser for the opportunity to follow her presentation. Uh, and I hope to push farther the ideas that she's presented. Uh, it's a, a big challenge to talk between cultures. I'm very fortunate to have made 15 visits to, your, to Chile in the last 10 years, and I have a, a great affection for both your country and for the teachers at the universities and schools. I hope that my comments will challenge and provoke a bit. Uh, I have spent 42 years as a, at working in a university as a teacher educator, and I'm still trying to better understand how does someone learn to teach. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to give you a link that uh, will give you an opportunity to respond to one, two, or three of the questions that I have posed for which I would like some feedback. Um, I'm uh, very attached to the idea of inviting the people I speak to to provide comments at the end. And I hope some of you will take note of that link and uh, send some comments for me. Uh, feel free to disagree with me. Please listen, but then discuss what I offer with your colleagues. Uh, the theme I have in the, on the issue of linking the university and the schools is that there are three roles involved in the operation of initial teacher education. The professors, the teachers at the university, the teachers in the schools, and the teacher students who are learning to teach. And each of these three groups must learn to listen better to each other to understand their perspectives. I speak about taking risks in this presentation because learning will not improve if our practices don't change and taking risks, making changes in our practice does make people nervous. I've had the great opportunity uh, to share discussions of personal practice with a very good friend in Chile, 
Many of you are aware of Rodrigo Fuente Alba, who is now the Dean of Education at Universidad Autónoma. Uh, Rodrigo has helped me in studying my own teaching. Uh, he uh, very carefully and uh, persistently watched every one of my classes uh, in teaching teachers how to teach physics over a period of four years. And the conversations uh, that we've had about those classes have probably been uh, the most important conferences uh, and discussions I've had with anyone about my teaching over a period of 42 years. Um, at this point, I will switch to my slides and uh, I think the first thing I should do is tell you something about who it is you're listening to. Uh, I, in 1963, I was 21 years old and I had just finished a physics degree at Cornell University in the Estados Unidos. Um, I volunteered to be a teacher in the Peace Corps and was sent to Nigeria a country in West Africa, where I taught for two years with no training whatsoever. Um, and I honestly think that uh, I became a good teacher over those two years as I learned from experience. And this is probably the primary reason why uh, my thinking is dominated entirely by our learning from experience. Um, we need to remember how does someone learn to teach? Every single one of us, including me as a volunteer teacher with no training in 1963, learned to teach by watching hundreds of teachers over a period of perhaps 15 or 20 years. Um, as Saren very uh, clearly pointed out, our challenge is that it's one thing to learn by watching, it's another thing to learn, to learn how to think like a teacher. But if our teaching practices don't change, our student learning is not going to change. And as I mentioned, changing practices means taking risks. I always like to tell my students that we learn, remind them that we learn in three different ways. We learn from personal experience, we learn from observation, and we learn by listening or reading. As Sharon pointed out, what our learning from experience is not always reliable, and that's something very important for teacher educators to consider. Uh, the simple example I like to use to about to emphasize these three different ways of learning is, is a, an example such as the stove is hot. It's, we, every parent knows that if you tell a child the stove is hot, the child is probably going to want to go and gain some personal experience, and that's often unfortunate. We can learn it, a stove is hot by watching someone jump away, or we can learn by touching the stove ourselves. Personal experience is much more powerful than observing, and observing is much more powerful than being told. We have all learned to teach by watching teachers for many years. Being told how to teach is much less effective. Uh, before I jump to the next slide, I want to insert something here uh, as background uh, that I occurred to me as I was listening to Sharon Feynman's presentation. Uh, we always focus on classrooms in schools. I think it's very important to remember that classrooms at the university are also classrooms. I agree with Sharon that it would be ideal if mentor teachers we're practicing the teaching practices that we want our students to learn, to emulate, and to use in their own classrooms. In my 42 years at Queen's University, we never made any progress on that issue, even though we all understood it and we believe it. The only classrooms that the university has the direct opportunity to change is its own classrooms. And I learned, this is much of what I learned by having discussions with Rodrigo as he watched my teaching in the university. One of the major themes I have here is that 
those of us teaching in universities need to model the teaching practices that we want students to use in classrooms. And we also need to be explicit and unpack and be thoughtful and explanatory about those practices so that students can understand we need to reveal our thinking processes to our students so that they can see how we think about our teaching in the university. Teachers professional learning is a very complex topic. Learning by doing is not just the action. We need to think about the action. We need to learn its effects and we need to rethink our own assumptions. Copying others isn't enough. We need to understand why we are doing what we are doing. Oh. I hope you can see my screen now, my apologies. Is it, is it okay now? Well. I'm gonna stop a minute and see if I can solve this problem. Rodrigo, is it okay now? Doctor Tom, eh, todavía no podemos visualizar. Eh, creo que ahora sí, ahora lo podemos ver entonces. Eh, Está compartiendo pantalla. Está compartiendo, My apologies. Compartiendo su PPT. Thank you. My, my apologies, everyone. Um, obviously, I'm not an expert at doing this sort of international presentation by Zoom. Um, so I will just uh, remind you uh, of the slides that I've that I've missed that you have missed as I was talking. Um, and uh, this is being recorded, so uh, perhaps uh, those who seek a, a copy will be able to see them. Uh, we learn in three different ways, and being told how to teach is probably one of the less effective ways of learning to teach. When we learn by doing, we need to think about the action, learn its effects, and rethink our assumptions. Copying others is not enough. We need to understand why. As Sharon pointed out, future teachers already know what teachers do. They do not know how teachers think about what they do when they teach. If you're like I was, no teacher has ever taken time to talk about how we learn and why we teach in certain ways. So my challenge to many particularly those in, who teach in university classrooms, are you willing to take a, a risk and be the first teacher who discusses how and why we teach and invites future teachers to share and develop their ideas? Uh, I'm very fond of the words in Spanish, contar no es enseñar, escuchar no es aprender. We rely heavily in schools around the world, not just in Canada, not just in Chile, on teachers talking and students listening. Uh, neither of these is particularly effective for the goal we have of having students learn. 
Learning from books is very different from learning from experience. Future teachers know how to try to learn from books. Initial teacher education must help them learn how to learn from experience in the practicum. In general, universities need to teach students how to learn from experience. And as I suggested earlier, that learning from experience needs to happen in the university classroom, as well as in the schools where students are assigned for practicum. In the schools where they do practicum placements, we have little or no control over the particular kind of teaching that they're going to experience. The challenge we have at the university is to help them learn how to learn from that experience and to help them understand the experience when they return to the university classroom. Future teachers must be active in learning to teach. We must listen to them. And here I return to my idea about more listening is required. We must engage them in analyzing teaching, not just in analyzing their teaching, but in analyzing our teaching of them. Here I want to uh, illustrate how a teacher educator can begin to listen to future teachers. Uh, there's very limited listening goes on in most classrooms. For me in a teacher education classroom, the easiest way to begin is with what in English we call a ticket out. I take a sheet of paper and cut it into four pieces I make a stack of these small pieces of paper. I insist that the students not put their name on it. And I ask them three questions, among others. In my class today, how good was your learning? And why was it good or bad? What is the most important idea you learned today? And what topic do you need to understand better? It probably took me three or four years to make this a regular practice so that I always remembered that two minutes before the end of class, I had to pass out the little sheets of paper. Once I did this in the first class, the second class and the third class, I no longer needed to explain to students what the piece of paper was for. They needed, they knew immediately what to do with the sheets. When I finished class, I took those sheets of paper to the photocopier, put four on each page and made copies so that I could have a clear record uh, without fumbling with little pieces of paper. And so I could understand what they had to say about my class. I very quickly found that by reading their responses, I knew what I needed to do in my next class. And I would, I would urge everyone who's never tried this experience to try it not just once, but more than a few times. Trying something once and deciding you don't like it is a huge mistake that many teachers have made, myself included. Uh, no practice is easy the first time we risk making a change. Uh, we're nervous about what we're going to see. We're nervous about how students will respond and how will we react. But I invite uh, anybody listening who's never tried this, either in a university or in a school, uh, to try this. Obviously, at the primary school level, uh, there would need to be adaptations of this uh, to uh, understand the children's reactions to the lesson. Once you ask students to make short comments about their experiences in your class, it's important to be patient. If responses are too simple, such as simply saying, my learning was good, you need to explain that you're looking for more detail. You're also looking for more honesty. It takes students a few days to realize that we're looking for real responses to the questions we ask not to, quest, not to responses that make us feel good. 
if a comment by a student inspires you to change your teaching, do it, try it. But it's very important to never single out a response as stupid or unhelpful. Never ask who wrote a ticket. And if you don't understand a particular ticket, ask everyone to help you. I clearly remember an incident uh, five or six years ago. Uh, I happened in a particular year to have student, two students in a class who spoke Spanish. And on a particular day, I got a response that I didn't understand. And at the next class, I read it out, but I didn't, I, I didn't ask who wrote it. I simply invited comments about it from the entire class. Later that day, I was walking to another building and one of my students came towards me from the other direction. Uh, it was Fernando and he stopped me and explained that he was the one who wrote the ticket. Uh, this turned out to be a very productive uh, step in my personal teaching relationship with Fernando and uh, reminded me again of the importance of having clear rules for myself about how I use students' comments. I'd like also to suggest that over time, we in, who teach at the university need to gradually become more open with our students about why we teach the way we do. Becoming more open with our students about how we teach and how we and they working together are coming to understand learning from experience. We as teachers and teacher educators have already learned a great deal from experience, but it's not always the best experience or we've not always learned the most important lessons from it. And I believe very strongly that we in the university also need to understand that we are also still learning from experience. One of the ways that we in the, in the university need to learn more from experience is by listening to the teachers in schools and by listening to our own students, not only about their experiences in schools, but about their experiences learning in our classrooms. It's particularly important that we as teacher educators connect learning from experience to the theories we introduce in our classrooms at the university and to the practices that we recommend. If our teaching practices do not change, then our students' learning is not going to change. You can see here that I'm emphasizing over and over again, the best way to begin is to listen. Give students voice in your classroom. I would summarize this briefly in Spanish, enseñar es escuchar. One of the most prominent themes in the teacher education literature is the question of integrating theory and practice. We want this to happen, but the challenges for making it happen are enormous. It's not easy because learning theory and research or what I like to call book knowledge is very different from learning the skills of teaching by observing and acting, which I like to call knowledge from experience. Students are experts, if they've made it this far in the school system, most students are experts at learning from books, but they've had very little opportunity all their lives they've learned from experience, but it hasn't been learning that they were going to use in the professional practice of teaching. And so this is where I like, again, emphasize the idea of learning, helping students learn how to learn from experience. We hear a great deal about the word reflection in teacher education. 
And at the outset of this event today, uh, the, the word critical reflection was used. We hear reflection and critical reflection used constantly in, in teacher education in Canada and in Estados Unidos. Um, I was very fortunate in 1984 to have an opportunity to meet Donald Schoen in person when he gave three lectures at my university. And I've always insisted on talking not about reflection or critical reflection, but about reflection in action. Reflection in action means reflection that happens during action. For those learning from experience about teaching, it means reflecting during the action of teaching or during the action of participating in a university classroom experience that goes beyond talking. Reflection in action occurs when we respond to surprises and unexpected responses from our students. I want to share with you the most powerful example I've had from a former student of what I believe is reflection in action. This is a particularly memorable message from the student because I received it by email when I was in Chile on my way from Puerto Montt to Valdivia to give a talk to students at a university in Valdivia. And this turned out to be a real inspiration for the comments I had for those students. Uh, my next two screens are entirely a Spanish translation of what Bruce wrote to me. And so at this point, I'm going to ask the interpreters if they would read these two screens to the uh, people who are participating in this event.
in what Bruce wrote to me, I maintain that Bruce is not showing reflection. He's showing reflection in action. And I want to unpack that a little bit for you. What the student said surprised him. He didn't expect such a comment. He could have, re he could have rejected the comment and said, oh, you're just being silly or found some other way to dismiss it. But instead, what the student said made him reframe the situation. He saw it in a new way. He decided to teach the way he really wanted to teach instead of focusing on the, how the mentor teacher was responding and judging his teaching. He changed his practices. He acted differently. And in this particular case, not surprisingly, the students responded very positively to his changes. And it transformed what followed. Events like this don't happen every day, but I want to emphasize that the most important thing we can, one of the most important elements in learning from experience is paying attention to when the students we're teaching respond in unexpected, unpredicted, surprising ways. Uh, this is a message that I learned from listening to Donald Schoen, and I tried to carry through the remaining 35 years of my career as a teacher educator, and it consistently proved to be one of the most valuable insights I've gained uh, as a teacher educator. So what are some possible elements of genuine professional learning for teachers? Listening to students about how well they are learning. Listening to ourselves to discover deep down why we are teaching the way we do. Asking ourselves what our assumptions are about good teaching and good learning and reframing our practices when something in class surprises us or was unexpected. Every time something unexpected happens, it poses a risk. And we have to be very careful and attentive to how we respond. If we dismiss a student's action, we're never going to learn from it. If we see as it an opportunity to think in a new way and find a new way of responding and then testing the result of that new, new way to respond, then I think something close to what I would call genuine professional learning is happening to the individual teacher. Here are some of the changes that I think are needed. I want to emphasize that I understand that I'm speaking across cultures. These are changes that I believe need to happen here in Canada, just as much as they need to happen in countries anywhere, including in Chile. If we want to, if we genuinely want to improve the initial preparation of teachers. As I say that, I remember what Sharon said about improving the learning experiences of first year teachers, second year teachers in schools. I agree entirely, but the only climate that the university has any control over is the climate in its own classrooms. Professors in the Faculty of Education need to listen to professors in schools to understand why they find it difficult to respond to the theory and research findings that the university believes are so important. Professors in schools need to listen to professors in the university to understand why they often find it difficult to respond to the everyday problems of practice. But perhaps more important than either of those, universities and schools need to listen to future teachers to understand the challenges they experience as they are learning to teach. I understand that in Chile, 
students spend four or five years in a initial teacher education program. They grow, they have many, many different experiences over that, those four or five years. They are trying to learn from those experiences, but we have to understand the challenges and frustrations that they are experiencing. Uh, thanks to my good friend Rodrigo, I've had the opportunity to listen to some students in initial teacher education programs in Chile, and I hear the same comments from them that I hear from my own students here at Queen's University in Canada. I think one of the reasons it's difficult to have this listening is that university teachers are paid to do research and to teach theory. School teachers are paid to enable children to learn. We have all, even before our initial teacher education program, learned too much by observing other teachers without understanding how and why they were teaching as they did. Schools and universities need to help children understand how they learn and how they can improve their learning. This be can begin in simple ways at the primary level and become more complex at the secondary level. I've often said to students, there will never be an official curriculum that can be taught successfully or completely in the time available in the school year. This, because of the pressure that teachers feel to cover a particular curriculum. This may be one of the reasons why we don't talk very much with students about the quality of their learning and how they can improve it. I was very grateful at the end of Sharon's presentation for the concern about strict educational policies. There are strict educational policies in every country in the world. Unfortunately, the people who prepare them and the politicians who approve them tend not to understand teaching in the way that we do. Everybody has watched teachers, but only those of us who do teaching eventually come to learn and understand it. And so all the, all the challenging risks that I'm suggesting here have to be carried out while also living within the strict world of those educational policies. In most educational systems, including in Canada, the voices of students are never or rarely heard. It's easy to assume that students are in the classroom only to receive knowledge from the teacher. But students do have opinions about teaching and if you have any doubt, you only have to remember the times when you were a student in school yourself. We all talked about the teachers we liked, the teachers who taught well, and the teachers who were disasters as teachers. And I would emphasize to you the phrase, listening involves giving voice to students. Here I will again invite the translators to read this page. Uh, this is a comment uh, written by a student in my class in 2013-2014. And I invite you to, uh, he wrote this obviously at the end of the eight months of the course that I was teaching him. And he presented this in a very powerful way uh, to the rest of the class just before we finished. And I hope you find it as moving and as powerful as I do. Thank you. 
here I offer you a suggestion if we really want to improve <clears throat> our students' learning in programs of initial teacher education. We all rely at the university heavily on talking when we're teaching. We save our writing for our research. I've come to the view that a teacher needs to write a little every day <clears throat> about his or her practice. We need to listen to ourselves as well as to others. Twenty years ago, I took myself back to the secondary school physics classroom uh, and taught one class <clears throat> for 75 minutes every day for five months. Uh, this was a uh, year 12 physics class. It was a, the first time I did it was overwhelming. I did it again the next year. And every day when I returned to the university, <clears throat> I took 10 minutes to write to myself about my teaching. And I still have that record of that year of teaching in the secondary school. I went I undertook this practice to remind myself what it is I was trying to help people learn how to do. But teaching myself the practice of writing about my experiences in the classroom uh, was something that I will never forget. And I recommend it uh, to others whenever I have the opportunity like today. <clears throat> As I near the end here, and I do have a few more slides, um, if my ideas seem crazy, or if you think my ideas won't work in Chile, please at least find one or two colleagues and talk about these ideas. Starting to teach in a different way is not easy. I, I invite people to take a risk by making one small change and then listen to see what happens. Don't dismiss it on the first try if you really believe it should have made a difference. But ultimately, every change we make, we need to decide if the change was good or if what we were doing before might be a better approach. Uh, here, I want to remind you again that I invite you to respond to, uh, in any way you like, to one or more of the questions that you would find at this particular link. So I'd like to give you a minute to copy this link uh, and uh, use it anytime later today uh, when you, if you have time and opportunity uh, to provide a few responses. Uh, obviously, I'm happy to have the uh, responses in any language. Um, I can probably find a way to, uh, thanks to Google, to uh, make a translation. And if you particularly need a response, uh, you can include your email address. If I get lucky and receive a lot of responses, it'll take me some time, but I will do my very best to respond to anybody who leaves an email address. And if you uh, copy the address, but find it doesn't work, uh, but would like to leave comments, I hope you will contact uh, the university uh, and uh, perhaps get the correct version of the, uh, of the link. So that was the address for the ticket out. And these are the questions that appear. What was the most interesting idea in the presentation I've made in the last 45 minutes? What part of the presentation did you disagree with? In what way would you like to make a change in your practice? Those are each uh, responses that you can say as little or as much as you wish. And the, the last question, what is your role? Simply asks, are you a teacher at the university? Are you a student in a teacher education program? Or you are, are you a teacher in a school? I would appreciate hearing from any and all of you and I've also listed here on this screen my email address again, if you uh, have any particular reason for wanting to write to me.
Um, I thought it would be useful uh, at the very end here, given that I've got a couple minutes, uh, to show you uh, examples of what a ticket out of class in a teacher education classroom looks like. Um, because it's a favorite of mine and because it was easy to find, uh, I've chosen uh, four comments from uh, by, made by my students in January of 2019. Uh, this was halfway through my course. And uh, this is particularly memorable because I received these tickets from my students while I was uh, visiting Chile uh, and doing a visit to a research project in Valparaiso. Um, I'll read these uh, since these are in English and I didn't have time to translate them. I found today to be very valuable. I surprised we were all able to stay on topic without Tom, but we did a great job. I also found it interesting that many of us chose to read the same articles for the assignment. I think many of us are interested in learning more about ideas from our discussions. Another wrote, it really speaks to Tom's teaching in the atmosphere he's created that this self-directed class has gone so well. These discussions always give me more to think about and the discussion about authority at the end is something I want to dive deeper on. It was very informative to hear about which specific strategies worked during the practicum and which ones didn't. The universal of PayOA was amazing to see and hints at underlying inquiry process, which is intrinsically interesting and exciting. I liked the discussions on the practicum. It was great to hear everyone's passage. Oh. I got some great ideas for my own teaching, but also reflect one of once on my own practicum. I also saw how we were able to handle class even without Tom here. We were able to have a good product class with good discussions. This was a memorable experience for me because I knew I was going to be away for a week in Chile. The students had plenty of warning. And uh, every time I spoke about it, I just assumed that they would meet without me. Um, one of the surprising uh, comments they made later was that most of them came to the class solely to see who else would appear in the class on a day when they knew the teacher wasn't going to be there. Um, as you can see, halfway through the year, this says something about the uh, kind of relationship that I had developed with my students. At this point, I will stop. Uh, there seems to be a few minutes left. Uh, I will try to figure out how to stop sharing my screen and how to join the conversation uh, in case there are some questions that I can respond to in the time that we have available. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias, doctor Tom Russell. Eh, sí, hay preguntas y las voy a leer en este momento. Eh, dice, hola, eh, profesor, soy una docente en formación de Curicó, Chile. La pregunta es, ¿cómo se podría adoptar las sugerencias de los estudiantes para aplicarlas en clases? sin que se pierda la relación entre el profesor y el estudiante. Esa es la pregunta que nos hizo entonces Arlet de Curicó. Uh, I really appreciate that you've included the the, the issue of keeping the teacher student relationship. Obviously, the kind of teacher student relationship that I could have with teacher students in my own classes is different from the kind of relationship that one can have with children in year one of the schooling. Uh, we all know that here we face the challenge that teacher student relationships are very different from friend to friend relationships. 
And one of the biggest challenges I remember learning in my own early years of teaching was how to find that, how to, how to massage that teacher-student relationship. Um, the important thing for me would be to find, a, to be creative. There are many other ways than the ones I've suggested for learning how to listen better to students. And here I would rely on the, on the knowledge within the, each individual teacher's relationship with the children to find creative ways of understanding more about the quality of their learning and whether they understand what we're trying to do with them. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Tom, eh, por esta respuesta que nos llegó desde Curicó, eh, de Arlet. Muchas gracias, Arlet. Y también tenemos otra eh, pregunta, doctor Tom. Eh, esta pregunta es de Vicente, a quien saludamos, a Vicente Spindola, y él dice lo siguiente. Hola, profesor. ¿Considera que la capacidad de reflexión en la acción ¿Debe surgir de manera casi espontánea o debe ser moderada? Entonces él nos dice esto. Eh, profesor, ¿considera que la capacidad de reflexión en la acción debe surgir de manera casi espontánea o debe ser moderada? Um. The reflection that I, in action that I was speaking about focused on the teacher. Uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to reflection in action as it might happen to students. Um, we cer it's certainly possible. It's certainly what we're looking for. Uh, your, your question is reminding me that as we teach students, we are trying to get them to reframe their thinking about the topics that we are teaching them. Uh, we aren't doing this uh, just to entertain, or, and we aren't doing this to bore people. We're trying to get them to genuinely change how they think about what they're doing in the world and the skills that they have. Um, reflection and action is something that an individual teacher needs to learn to recognize. Uh, it's very easy to dismiss an unwanted response an unexpected response as inappropriate or unimportant. And we all have to, I remember very well the many years it took me to learn how to respond properly to unexpected events in the classroom. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Tom, eh, por esta respuesta. Y vamos a ir a otra, pre otra pregunta más que nos llega acá al chat, la voy a ver en este momento. Eh, bueno, acá dicen, eh, hola, muy interesante la idea de enseñar cómo piensa un docente. También corremos riesgos, dice acá una persona, de transmitir errores o equivocaciones. ¿Cómo se resuelve esto eh, de repente de equivocarse? Uh, the minute the minute you say that, I remember an experience in the late 1990s. Um, I was tired. I was uh, teaching a class that I with students that I knew well, and I made a very insulting comment to a particular student's question. I suggested uh, that uh, surely he couldn't really be asking that question. Um, and I was really suggesting it was a stupid question. Uh, that was probably one of the biggest mistakes I made in my teaching career. Uh, it can be very, very difficult. I'm not sure that I ever recovered well from that with that group. Um, 
my, my immediate reaction to your question, uh, which I like very much, is that uh, this is an opportunity to teach our students how to think like a teacher. Every teacher is going to make mistakes. If we can return in, an, in another class to the experience, unpack it, try to suggest why we ex, ex, uh, reacted as we did in the mistaken way, and invite our students to suggest more positive or constructive ways to respond, I think this would help to emphasize the importance of teaching our, our students how to think like a teacher. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Dr. Tom, eh, por su respuesta. Y también nos vamos a ir a la última, eh, la última pregunta que, que tenemos que nos llega a través del chat por eh, el tema del tiempo. Y es pregunta, dice acá, para el doctor Russell. Russell. Eh, ¿Cuál es el papel eh, de la teoría en esta propuesta de reflexionar en la acción? Y ella dice después... ¿Cómo se integra la teoría a la experiencia cotidiana del estudiante universitario que se está formando como futuro profesor? That's probably one of the most important questions a teacher educator can face. Um, we need to be experts on theory. We also need to be experts on practice, on our own practice. And our own practices have to be consistent in as many ways as possible with the theories that we believe it's important for our students to understand. We, I'm having trouble only because it's such an interesting question and I wish we had 10 minutes and not one. Um, my own experience suggests that the most important thing we could do if we want to teach theory is to introduce a practice that's consistent with the theory and then introduce the theory afterwards by referring it back to the practices that the students have already experienced in our classrooms. In the time available, it's probably smartest if I just stop there, but thank you for a, uh, a really insightful question. I hope everyone in the audience will uh, remember it and, uh, and take it seriously. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Tom, si quiere, puede eh, eh, responder eh, bien, o sea, profundizar más la respuesta, no hay problema, para que nos pueda quedar a todos claro. Adelante. <laughs> oh, I need to reflect in action. I didn't expect that response. <clears throat> um, Over many years, I learned that the most important class I teach is probably the very first time I meet the students. My classes were two hours. And in, that, in those first two hours, it's very common for a teacher to uh, welcome the students, uh, learn their names, and uh, In my case, in my university, uh, the teacher would pass out a copy of what we call a course outline that would give them all the university details and all the details of when the classes meet and what the assignments are that they have to do. I eventually taught myself that that was the worst kind of first class I could have. And the most important thing I could do was to engage the students with the most exciting teaching practice I know. For a science teacher, that, that teaching procedure is called predict, observe, explain. You put a situation in front of the students, you ask them to observe, 
but before they observe the situation, you ask them to make a prediction and to write it down. Then you show them the event. And it's very easy for a science teacher to find many, many events like this where the students will be wrong. And it's having them make a mistake in their prediction and then introducing them to the explanation that makes the explanation far more memorable and, and important for them. Um, and so I learned that I would have by instead of reading a course outline on the first day, I would introduce an exciting teaching procedure, uh, a strategy that I knew would engage them. And then we would discuss why did you like that and what is distinctive, what is difficult, what's important, uh, and unpack the teaching procedure. Uh, I would urge everybody who is teaching future teachers to find a way to engage students on the very first day in a conversation about an exciting teaching strategy. Thank you very much for the extra time. Muchas gracias, doctor Tom, eh, por la respuesta. Gracias por la presentación. Nos han llegado acá muchos comentarios de excelente exposición, dice acá, eh, del doctor Tom. Eh, están todos muy contentos entonces con esta eh, exposición, con esta presentación. Eh, asimismo, también la presentación de la doctora Charon, que también estuvo muy interesante. Han sido los comentarios que nos han llegado eh, al chat eh, de este seminario internacional. Bueno, y eh, una vez ya eh, continuamos entonces con el seminario internacional, nos vamos a ir ahora a un receso de 15 minutos, por supuesto agradeciéndole a Tom su presentación, y nos encontramos a las 11.30 horas, y contarles que la próxima conferencia va a estar Carolina Irmas, el próximo taller, digo, eh, va a estar Carolina Irmas, la doctora Carolina Irmas, y el doctor Rodrigo Fuente Alba, así es que nos vamos a este pequeño receso, y a las 11.30 regresamos. <música>